Hi guys, welcome back and today's lecture is going to be on hernias. So before we get started, I know a lot of you read the, you know, the common books that you use for the clerkship and you get confused with all these, you know, names, pantaloon hernias, literase hernia, Richter's hernia, spigalian hernia, and etc. That's not what the focus of the exam is and that's not the focus of the review. I will tell you what exams, uh, what um, hernias you need to focus on, but otherwise it's pretty self-explanatory. What they're going to ask you, what are the risk factors and what are complications and what you need to watch out for. Once you get that down, you don't need to worry about the other ones. For, you know, you know, if you're on awards and your attending is asking you questions, yeah, you should, you know, learn about that. But if you're awarded for the purpose of the exam, I would not really worry about that. So let's get started. So, by the end of this lecture, I want you, these are the questions I want you to consider. What, what's, if you have ischemic or orchitis after hernia repair, what's the most likely due to? What's the most common hernia in males? What's the most common hernia in females? What's the most common hernia overall? And some of the complications of hernia. If you could answer this question by the end of this lecture, then you're golden. All right, so let's start with the you know, case. You have an 87-year-old mentally disabled female in the ED presenting with nausea and vomiting. Has not had bowel movements or past flatus. Per caregiver, she noticed a lump in her thigh that went away when she was laying down about three weeks ago. Exam shows increased bowel sounds and she's tachycardic. She's air, she has an air thermic mass on her side that is tender and is below the inguinal ligament. So obviously here, not to belabor the point, I'm telling that she has a femoral hernia. So if you watch the bowel obstruction lecture, you could already tell that she has some signs of bowel obstruction. But now here, we want to discuss the hernias that cause the bowel obstruction and just go a little bit deeper into hernia discussion, right? She has femoral hernia that's leading to obstruction and then that's causing some of the symptoms. So go review the bowel obstruction lecture if it's not clear by the end of this. All right, so always let the question stem guide you. Right. If they tell you the mass protrudes was valsalva, so what is valsalva? Closing the ma uh, the glottis against forced exertion. Right. So you, essentially, what you're doing is you're increasing your abdominal pressure. Right. Increasing abdominal pressure. What is that going to do? It's going to cause the hernia to bulge out. Right. But it resolves when you're laying down supine. When you're laying down supine, everything equilibrates and it kind of goes away. If they tell you that, essentially they're telling you this person has a hernia, and then just focus on that. Simple formula that you need to focus on for hernias. Abdominal wall weakness plus increased abdominal pressure, it gives you hernia. So why is that formula important? Because then you could look at this formula and tell about talk about the risk factors for hernia. And that's where they will try to get you at a little bit higher level questions because they don't usually ask you what kind of hernia this is, what caused the hernia, and what can, what's the problem with this hernia. All right, some common risk factors. So looking at the formula again, what is the wall weakness? Prior surgery, pregnancy. So what's that cause? It causes the muscles to expand, or you cause a specific damage to the, the muscle. For example, if you're lifting heavy, you have a cesarean section. So that's going to make it wall weakness. Increased pressure. So this is where they can get you with this. They want you to think something other than a hernia. Somebody has a chronic cough. Are they a smoker? The, you know that there's COPD and they're coughing all the time may exacerbate the hernia, but maybe they want you to think about cancer right? Lung cancer. So you want to look, be able to look out for that and look what the question is asking. Ascites, what happens? Fluid accumulates, causes increased pressure, and that causes a hernia, right? Then you got to watch out for if this patient has cirrhosis, right? Because that's what causes ascites. Then you got to worry about screening for liver cancer. Now watch out for that. Constipation, right? Somebody's older and it's causing the hernia's worth, then you got to think of you know, colon cancer. Somebody's having increased straining for urination, then you got to think of BPH and prostate cancer. That's a very common scenario, okay? So, you know, look at the signs they give you. Somebody's weightlifting for like a bodybuilder who's heavy lifting, uh, somebody who's a laborer, heavy laborer, you know, they, they, they will tell you and just, you know, watch and don't and think about what they're asking. All right, so let's talk about what exactly is a hernia. So hernia, I want you to think of three components, right? So if you look over here, right, you have the abdominal wall defect. That's your number one, right? 
and it is a peritoneal lining lines the intestines and whatever is in under the peritoneum and then through the defect the whole peritoneum comes out right that becomes the hernia sac right the hernia sac is just literally lined up by peritoneum and inside is you have your hernia contents all right so the most important thing is the abdominal wall defect a hole in the abdominal wall the floor of the abdomen the muscles or something that causes a peritoneum which becomes the hernia sac to bulge out all right so why are hernias bad what do i mean by bad what's what why we care about it so much what is it going to cause it's it causes an obstruction right intestine gets stuck there's no blood flow and there's necrosis right so here we talk about the words that gets used a lot on the wards and on the exam so you can hernia can get incarcerated what does that mean so if the if it bulges out right it get it can get stuck right there and if it gets stuck in a little hole and you can't reduce it you can't push it back in that means it's incarcerated it's non-reducible right and then if it gets stuck for a long time and the neck is small enough that it causes blood flow disruption then neck that could cause strangulation right so incarceration that means non-reducible it's stuck there can cause strangulation which means an ischemia right not necessarily death death of a, you know the hernia contest which is usually the bowel right and it could cause necrosis which is the bad outcome that's what you're worried about all right so general principles of dangerous hernias when you sh when when you should the alarms go in your head when you're reading the question if it's shorter duration if somebody comes to you is like hey i had this hernia for 30 40 years right that's not about because it's for 30 40 years if it was gone to a bad level where it's going to strangulate if we've already done so so if it's been there without a problem for 30 years not not so much worrisome if it's a femoral hernia we'll discuss it more in details that's a you know that's a very dangerous hernia that you should consider and shorter neck size so if you look over here this is an umbilical hernia um, so you can see the neck where the abdominal wall defect is and where the bowel struggle in, uh, you know, sticks out there is shorter, right? That's more dangerous, whereas this hernia. Um, now, this could be very bothersome, but it's a big hernia. That means the neck is big, and that means there's a lot of space for the bowel to go, uh, going out. That's less dangerous than this one. All right, strangulation. So remember the four signs. So if you watch the bowel obstruction lecture, you're very familiar with it. The four signs, fever, tachycardia, leukocytosis, and skin changes. Now, when we discussed bowel obstruction, we said localized abdominal pain. Now, the hernia is actually visible, right? You could tell where the hernia is. That's going to cause localized um, changes, right? The skin changes. You see, if the skin is turning red, that means something really bad is going right underneath the skin for the content, and the bowel is dying, so there's a bad sign. You remember these points. When you see these four signs, you always got to think surgery, always. Strangulation, that means necrosis is almost inevitable. It's bad. The bowel is losing blood supply. All right? But you read the question, and you're like, oh, surgery is not an answer choice. So if you think about it, right, if a bowel gets stuck and uh, it's about to die, right, or it possibly died, right, became necrosed, right, what's inside the bowel? Stool contents and bacteria right you open it up and you want you know the bowel contents to spill into the peritoneum what's that going to cause cause peritonitis so what do you have to do before before right before the surgery right or while you're wheeling the patient away in there you got to give it an antibiotic the antibiotic that i want you to remember is suffoxetine or any third generation antibiotics it covers the gram negatives and gives it an anaerobes right um just one more point um if the suffoxone is not an answer choice, they're looking for anaerobic coverage. Metronidazole, flagell, is also a good choice for anaerobes. Now, let's talk about the couple of hernias that you need to know for the exam. Uh, today, we're going to go over the inguinal hernia, direct versus indirect, femoral hernia, umbilical hernia, peristomal hernias, ventral hernias, and sliding hernias. We're going to go over them and what you need to know for the exam. Indirect inguinal hernia, probably one of the co most common questions you're going to get. It is the most common hernia in men, women, and kids. So I want you to remember that. It is the most common hernia in men, women, and kids. So don't say that women have more femoral hernias. We'll talk about where th this word gets confused, right? But indirect inguinal hernia is the most common hernia. I want you to think of it as a congenital issue. Now we'll just we'll look at the embryology and how it all happens. But this is since birth. Something uh, you know, something you know went wrong or didn't form right, right? This is not acquired, 
And the buzzword that I want you to remember is persistently patent processus vaginalis, right? And we'll discuss what is that on the next slide, right? Essentially what it is, it, it is an outpouching of peritoneum that descends with the you know, testes through the abdomen, and it gives it a little opening, and then we'll go over the picture. It does not transilluminate. Right? It means, what does transluminate mean? So if a male comes into the, you know, and you're worried about some kind of scrotal mass, what's the first thing you'll do? Right? Gonna put a light. If the light goes through, that means it's something else, and we'll discuss what it is. But if it doesn't go through, it's a bowel in there, right? So the light's not gonna pass through, so that's gonna tell you that, ah, oh, this is a hernia. Okay? It goes through the deep and superficial inguinal rings, and it is lateral to the inferior epigastric vessels. Right? So let's look at the picture. Right. So processus vaginalis, what happens is the outpouching of a peritoneal, right? The peritoneal sac. It starts in the abdomen, so it goes through the deep super uh, inguinal ring, right? It descends with you know, it descends with the spermatic cord to the scrotum to the with the testes, right? It goes through the deep superficial in inguinal ring and a superficial inguinal ring and descends into the testes. So the hernia is very intimate. Uh, it, um, my apologies. So this uh, processus vaginalis opening, right, uh, is going to be very close to the spermatic cord. It comes down with the spermatic cord. And if you can imagine, right, this is a peritoneal opening. If this doesn't close, you know, close to birth, what is it going to happen? It's essentially an opening, right, for a bowel. It's like bowel is just going to slide right into there, okay? And remember, look how close it is to the spermatic cord and all the important structures. Right? And here, nicely in the picture, you can see that it's going lateral to the you know, inferior epigastric vessels. Right? Some of the common mnemonics they use during medical school and like the first, you know, when you're studying for step one is MD, don't lie. So M as in medial is direct and lateral is lateral to the inferior epigastric is indirect. Right? And we'll go with some of the mnemonics that you need to know. So spermatic cord, in, 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 indirect inguinal hernia in males, in females, as you can tell, it's the round ligament of uterus that goes through the deep inguinal ring and a superficial inguinal ring. Okay? So it is the round ligament of uterus. And sometimes it might get asked on the exam. And if usually, you know, if it's not on the surgery exam, it could get asked on the on the OB-GYN shelf as well. How about direct inguinal hernia? That is more common in, you know, older men, right? It is less likely to incarcerate. I want you to think of it as a structural weakness of the transversalis fascia. Now, you don't have to remember the transversalis fascia, right? But it's essentially a structural weakness in the wall of the abdomen. It is acquired. So if it's acquired, it takes a long time to develop, right? So a young person is, not, is less likely to have a direct inguinal hernia than, for example, this male who's been lifting for, you know, eternity, for a long time. Obviously, he's going to have some structural weakness compared to a young male. It goes through the Hasselbach's triangle, and we'll discuss it on the next slide, what it is, right? And it's medial to the inferior epigastric vessels, and it goes only through the superficial inguinal ring. So this picture is going to demonstrate both the points. First of all, a common question you get asked on the boards and for your understanding, right? You have the arcuate line, and above and below it, your uh, rectus sheath or your abdominal wall is a lot different. So above the arcuate line, you have an anterior rectus sheath and a posterior rectus sheath. And your posterior rectus sheath is your transversalis fascia, and your in external uh, internal oblique that makes the posterior rectus sheath, whereas below it is only your transversalis fascia that makes the posterior rectus sheath. So it's a little bit weaker below the arcuate line. So that's where the direct hernias usually occur, right? And this is where the Hasselbox triangle comes in play. So your Hasselbox triangle is medially is your rectus abdominis muscle, you know, inferiorly is your inguinal ligament, and laterally is your inferior epigastric arteries and vessels, right? So I want you to remember this. A direct hernia goes through directly through the Hasselbach's triangle, right? And if you just remember that, it goes through directly through that, that means it's just going to be medial to the vessel, right? So just remember that, right? And you can see from the picture, it goes through the muscle wall right here, only going to go through the superficial or the external inguinal ring and goes into the scrotum, whereas the, the indirect hernia will go through both. Femoral hernia, very high yield topic for the, for the shelves in step two. Um, it Obviously, it's uh, hernia contents pass through the femoral canal. So remember the uh, navel uh, uh, mnemonic they used in, uh, in the first couple of years of medical school, right? Lateral to medial, N stands for nerve, A stands for artery, V stands for vein, 
E is the empty space, right? And L is the lymphatics. It is more common in females, right? But it's not the most common, right? Um, actually, femoral hernias account only for 3% of uh, hernias in female, right? So, um, so they're not the most common. So remember, the most common hernia across all you know, male, females, and children is indirect. And it passes below the inguinal ligament. So you read a question, right? And you're like, oh, there's a bulge right under the inguinal ligament. And its question talks about the hernias. Then you essentially know that they're talking about a femoral hernia. Now, pregnant females, they're at higher risk. So what happens when during labor, right, when you give a vaginal birth, right, it causes a lot of pressure into the veins, and the femoral veins just kind of dilate and essentially get the space bigger, right? So that is, that's the reason uh, reasoning behind why pregnant females are higher. So if you get a question, so what is not a risk factor, right, in this female, it is not a C-section, right? Because you're not, you're not, in the vaginal birth, you're causing all that pressure versus C-section, no, you're not. Okay, so it's not just the fact that they're female, it's the fact that which type of birth they give. Uh, so let's think, you know, look at this picture. Um, so you have the empty space right next to medial to the vein, right? So what is it going to happen, right? It's, the inguinal ligament is very rigid on top. You have the bone right behind it, right? So if it gets stuck, it's highly likely to incarcerate and strangulate. So what do you do? You could actually, you know, cut the inguinal ligament and try to fix that. So that's a very quick, you know, common question that you get. But don't get tricked. Not every inguinal regional mass is a femoral hernia. So they could trick you, right? There are lymph nodes. What is right next to medial to the empty space is the L. That's the lymph nodes, right? So read the question stem carefully. They could talk to you about, you know, infection, cancer, trauma, right? So let's quickly review over the common inguinal lymphadenopathy. If you have an older patient with weight loss and has not had a colonoscopy, you start thinking of some kind of rectal cancer and, uh, you know, colon cancer. Most likely, you know, rectal or anal cancer because that's where the drainage is. Now, infections, right? So we'll cover this in internal medicine lectures as well, but this is, you know, they could show up in your surgery shelves, and it's a good review for step two, right? Haemophilus ducreae or chancroid, it's a painful with unilateral painful swollen lymph node. So remember that it is painful. Haemophilus do cry, you do cry. It's painful. It's unilateral. Herpes. Herpes that are blisters, that are characteristic, you know, the vesicles, right? But compared to symptoms of chancroid, which is also painful, right? And you could also get lymph lymphadenopathy. You get systemic symptoms, malaise, cold-like symptoms, right? Whereas the chancroid, you don't. And if you have systemic symptoms, you get a bilateral, um, you know, lymphadenopathy. So just remember, you have systemic symptoms compared to chancroid. Lymphanogroma venarium, or it's, uh, you know, um, uh, chlamydia. It's caused by chlamydia. And that is one thing you remember. It is painless, and the lymph node enlarged after the skin lesion disappears. So this is very high yield. It's going to definitely show up on your ob guy shelf and step two. Um, so how to differentiate between these. And you have syphilis, right? That is also a painless ulcer, but you get bilateral lymph nodes. And a granuloma inguinal, you got painless ulcer, and you get no inguinal lymph enlargement, right? So kind of a good review. Haemophilus do cry, it is painful. You do cry. It is unilateral, right? Herpes, you have systemic symptoms. Now you got lymphogranuloma, which is caused by chlamydia. It is painless, and it comes up after, right? And you have painless, right? Then you want to compare to uh, syphilis, right? Ah, now syphilis is also painful, but you get bilateral lymph nodes, usually in association with the disease. And a granuloma inguinal is painless also without the lymph nodes. So I would go through this list, just kind of memorize it, and uh, you know compare which ones. But this is something that could show up because it's very confusing between you know all these. Sliding hernia. So it's a type of indirect hernia, usually on the left side. And a hernia, the key with this is a hernia sac contains a retroperitoneal organ, right? So you're reading a question, they're asking some kind of a sliding hernia, right? Essentially, what they're at, and they give you answer choices. Essentially, what you need to do is pick out an answer choice that has a retroperitoneal organ. So you remember from your step one studying the mnemonic SAD pucker, right? It tells you the, the common uh, retroperitoneal organs.
Um, so you could go, you know, search it off. But in males, it's essentially either the sigmoid colon or bladder. It usually happens on the left side. So think of the left side as structure. So right side is kind of rigid, left side is sigmoid, it's floppy, there's a lot more space where you could herniate through. In females, it could be the reproductive organs or the bladder. So the bladder is both common in both, and it could be a colon in both of them. So why is this important? Is because when you're operating, right, and you give you a patient who had a you know routine hernia repair, right, and then you know literally 30, 40 minutes after the question, patient has peritoneal signs. They have hematuria because you went in the bladder. So that it should make you think that it's a sliding hernia, and you should be careful about that because sliding hernia has a retroperitoneal organ in it. Hernia is an infant is a very high yield topic too. So remember, direct hernia is very rare in a young person. Remember, direct hernias are acquired. So you, in an infant, they haven't had much time to have an abdominal wall weakness, right? If they give you a question with a kid in a hernia, it is not a direct hernia in the exam. It's either indirect hernia or umbilical hernia. That's one of the questions they'll ask you. And the question will describe a mass that protrudes when an infant is crying, right? And then they, Remember what we said about Valsalva. Now, you can't make a kid in Valsalva, right, because it's not going to listen to you. But when they cry, essentially, they increase the pressure in the abdomen and the mass pulses. So if they, if, you, if they describe an indirect hernia, so what you do is you repair it. 10% of the kids who have an indirect hernia have a bilateral hernia, so you got to check both sides. Now, the question is, if they have an umbilical hernia, you do not repair that. Right, you do a surgery only for persists after age five. So up until age five, four, four or five, you don't you don't do anything about it. So when do you uh, operate on it? If it goes, you know, age six, seven, still not going away, then you try to fix it. If it's getting bigger, right, and obviously if it gets incarcerated. And the thing is, when they discover umbilical hernia, umbilical corneas are characteristically more common in African Americans, and it is, um, you know, this is where it becomes important to talk about transelimination, right? And then we'll, we'll discuss in the future charts, right, in a second. So high yield points. Umbilical hernia are common in infants, right? We discussed that. So that's why you don't operate it till five. But they can also, you know, common in other diseases that they might want you to take a hint at. Uh, for example, the, one of the common ones they ask is congenital thyroid hypoplasia, right? And they will disguise signs of protruding tongue, developmental delay, uh, sorry, and not meeting milestones. So if they discuss, mom brings a kid, says, oh, they have this hernia, but then also in the stem is like it's not meeting developmental milestones, is uh, he's not acting like cell in the shell, you got to worry about this, right? Because remember, congenital thyroid hypoplasia can lead to you know, mental retardation. Uh, let's go over the, just like I said, we're going to go over the chart of, of um, what to do when a kid comes in with a scrotal mass. What do you do? We're going to discuss this, uh, we'll just discuss the non-painful part because we'll discuss the painful part in the future lectures. So a mom brings an infant, let's say he's about six, seven months old, with a non-painful mass, right? So in this, this scrotal mass. So what do you do? Um, first, you transeliminate it. You put a light in it. If it lights through, it's hydrocele. So what is a hydrocele? So remember what we talked about that uh, processus vaginalis, right? So if processus vaginalis stays open, right? So that means the bowel goes through it. Now let's say you know the, not all processus vaginalis didn't close all the way, or it becomes disconnected. So the scrotum part remains open, and uh, but uh, everything above that is closed and goes away, right? That little bit of peritoneum that's in the scrotum that's not in connection with the peritoneum, right, is just fluid in there. That's what you want to think about. And it will, the light will go through the fluid, okay? If it's not, they describe bag of worms, right, that increases valsalva. Those are your veins that get big. Then you think of varicocele, right? And if, if, if it's not that, then you, if it's a reducible mass or no, right? So if it's a reducible mass, you're thinking of a hernia, right? It goes back in, it comes out, it's not, doesn't transluminate because bowel does not give, it's not going to let the light go through. Then you think, you know, then you think that's a hernia. And the other stuff we'll talk about it later because then you got to, you know, worry about the, you know, testicular mass. And we'll talk about it in uh, future lectures. So essentially, that's the point of translimination. If it, if it does, then you're thinking of hydrocele. If it doesn't, it's either varicocele and hernia, and they'll make it clear in the question. Bag of worms versus a reducible mass. Umbilical hernia in ascites patients, right? If, so this is, essentially comes down to two points. If there's acute necrosis or strangulation, then you repair the hernia, but you also got to address the ascites at the same time. 
So what you do is you give them tips or anything that cause, uh, gives a shunt that decreases the uh, uh, portal hypertension. If the patient is stable, then you fix, fix the ascites problem first, right? So you give them a tips or you give a liver transplant or something that addresses that portal hypertension and wait and see if the hernia improves. If it doesn't, then you fix it. So there's no whole point of fixing it if you don't fix the ascites problem. So only fix it if it's acute necrosis or strangulation and you got to address the problem and the hernia at the same time if it's causing necrosis or strangulation. Um, ventral and incisional hernias. Uh, they're at the side of a surgical inf incision, so and they can get big. So you repair if there's signs of obstructive incarceration, so if they become sympathetic, symptomatic, and you have to repair with mesh. Peristomal hernias. Peristomal hernias, it's a hernia at the side of stomal formation. So essentially, what a stoma is, is the outpatch of the colon. You create a hernia, right? You take out, you make an abdominal wall defect, you take it out, and you put a bag over it, right? And unfortunately, that defect can get big and a colon slides right next to it. And unfortunately, in this, you know, in this uh, patient right here, it got really big. Now, this is a very common complication for, a, you know, a stoma formation, right? It can get obstructed, it can get necrosed, and also, you know, you know it gets really big, so you, could put, you can't put a bag over it, it's going to leak, right? And it's very uncomfortable for the patients. And remember what we discussed at the beginning? And just because it's big doesn't mean it's going to um, incarcerate. So it's a size and a neck size that you could go review at the beginning of the lecture. Uh, management, it's very simple. Uh, kind of like the small bowel obstruction lecture. You have an inguinal hernia. If it's strangulated, the four signs, right? Leukocytosis, fever, tachycardia, uh, localized pain or skin changes. Then, no question. Then you go um, and go fix the hernia. If it's symptomatic, right? That means incarcerated. That means it gets stuck in there, right? So what's the difference between incarcerated and strangulated? Incarcerated hernia, if you could reduce it, right? So what do you do? You try to reduce it two or three times. If that, you know, if that helps it, then you could, you know, be like, okay, this patient is improved. Let's wait until his vital signs improve and we could operate tomorrow or come back in a couple of days and we'll operate then. If you try to reduce it, you're like there for 30 minutes, 40 minutes, and the question will describe that, then you go to the operation. Okay? Then because it becomes strangulated, you can't reduce it. If they're asymptomatic or minimally, and you could watch, you know, watch for waiting or not, and this is a very contentious issue, so um, they will not ask you about that. Um, nervy complications. So common complications after uh, the hernia repair. Pain after hernia injury. Iliar inguinal nerve. That's what you want to think of. That's the most common, and especially after open repair. Hey, if you've seen this kind of case, you could see some of the surgeons actually, you know, ligate the iliar inguinal nerve because that could cause a lot of pain. If they describe pain on the anterior thigh, like it's the lateral femoral cutaneous nerve, right? Neuralgia paresthetica, right? Uh, lateral femoral cutaneous nerve. What happens when you put a mesh in, right? Sometimes the stable can go to that nerve, and that will cause the pain into the anterior thigh. Now, general femoral nerve is also important, and especially laparoscopic repair, and that will cause a loss of cremasteric reflex, right? And I will describe that, oh, you know, after the case, stroke of the, you know, the thigh, inner thigh does not cause the elevation of a testicle, it has a loss of a cremasteric reflex, all right? So iliac inguinal nerve, most common, right, especially after open repair, and a general femoral nerve is, they will describe a cremasteric reflex injury for you. Indirect hernia, there's a specific complication, right? So what do we discuss? Processus vaginalis in indirect hernia is very intimate to the spermatic cord, right? So you have to, you know, dissect it out and, uh, you know, be careful with it. There's arteries, there's nerves, there's spermatic cord itself. So, and you ligate the testicular artery. But that's not going to cause an ischemia. The reason being is testicle has arterial supply, from testicular artery, cremasteric artery, and the artery of the vas deferens. So if you take out one, you have two other that actually supply it. So it rarely causes an ischemia. But if you cause an injury to the vein, right, what's going to happen? It's going to cause the pampinor flexus. It's going to cause venous congestion, right? And the pressure gets so high, it's going to prevent an arterial inflow. And it causes too much venous congestion. That could cause ischemia too. So if you see a question on that, and you get a testicular ischemia or atrophy, it is because of a venous injury, not an arterial injury, and has a very high yield point. So some practical points that you remember, femoral hernia gets repaired no matter what. It's asymptomatic or symptomatic, you gotta repair it. 
If there's a hernia, you want to repair it with mesh. What does mesh do? It creates a tension-free repair. If you don't use a mesh, you have to put the tissues back together, right? So, and that causes a tension on the wound, so that, in theory, it causes more recurrence. So you put a mesh, you tie, you tie the tissue to the mesh, that's tension-free. If there's bilateral hernia, you do a laparoscopic repair, okay? So, but there's, there's a lot of contention. You do open versus closed, uh, open versus laparoscopic. And just remember, if there's bilateral hernia, that's the only indication of a laparoscopic. The other ones are very contentious, okay? And so remember, let's go back to the questions that we discussed earlier. So what is ischemic carcinosis caused, caused, caused by after hernia repair? It's the venous injury, right? Most common hernia in males is indirect. Most common hernia in females, that's a tricky question. Remember, 